hitting of the billiard ball causes the other one to move. So natural necessity was a heteronomy of efficient causes. That is, something caused the billiard ball to move in that direction with that velocity, or something caused the gas mixture to explode, something outside of them. Right? So heteronomy as opposed to autonomy means that something outside of it is causing it to behave in a certain way. And that's the way empirical explanation works. That's the way natural causality works. Something causes something else to happen. That's efficient causality, and it's something else, so it's heteronomy. Natural necessity was heteronomy of efficient causes. For every effect is possible only according to the law that something else determines the efficient cause to causality. What else, then, can freedom of the will be but autonomy? i.e., the property of the will of being a law to itself, giving itself a law. It has to be a law because it has to be causality, it has to be necessity, it has to be autonomous because it has to be one that has native will. But the proposition, the will is in all actions a law to itself, designates only the principle of acting on no maxim other than that which can also have as its object as a universal law. But this is just the formula of the categorical imperative and the principle of morality. Thus, a free will and a will under moral laws are one and the same. A free will in the sense of a will that is able to be caused, that is able to be causally efficient without being determined by anything outside of it. That is an autonomous free will governed by the principle of the categorical theory. Because it has to be a law, it has to be a law, in order to be cause causal, in order to be causally efficient, then it gives itself. I guess I'm still stuck on how the will be independent of any way of determining it. But it sounds like he's arguing for the non-existence of freedom here. He is arguing for the non-existence of empirical freedom. He is arguing for the non-existence of any experience of freedom. He is arguing for the impossibility of a natural scientific explanation or argument for freedom. That's just the point. Yeah, it's kind of answering your question. He's not saying that freedom means you're not um, affected by outsider causes. It's what's left over after you discount those outside causes. It's not, he's saying there's not just outside causes or something else that can cause and that other thing has to be the way. Um, kind of. <laughs> so um, Kant thinks that we can give empirical explanations of human behavior. as a scientific explanation. But he also thinks that we're driven to postulate um, a will also. Um, so that, this is what we have to do. Um, OK, so um, if freedom of the will is presupposed, morality, along with its principle, the categorical narrative, follows from it by mere analysis of its concept. So if we assume that we have a free will, then the implication is we're bound by the standard of the category. Um, so this is similar to the conclusion of part two. Um, if we assumed um, autonomy, then, now if we assume freedom, then we're bound by the moral law. Um, the problem is that we cannot get the proposition that we are, in fact, free, that we do, in fact, have a free will, simply by analysis. Kant thinks that that is a synthetic proposition. Um, so, so the claim that we are bound by the moral law is also synthetic. Um, so the question is, how do we know we're free? What kind of explanation or accounting can we give for um, our own freedom? Bottom of 57. Kant says, now I say, every being that can 
cannot act otherwise than under the idea of freedom is actually free in a practical respect, precisely because of that, precisely because it acts under the idea of freedom. That is, all laws that are inseparably bound up with freedom hold for it just as if its will had also been declared free in itself and in a way that's valid in theoretical philosophy. Um, okay, so notice, first of all, crucially, the contrast between practical and theoretical reason here. Um, Kant is claiming that if from a practical point of view, from a deliberative point of view, from the point of view where we are considering reasons to do one thing or another, from that practical point of view, from that deliberative point of view, um, if you take yourself to be free, sorry, um, if from a, that practical point of view, you take yourself to be free, um, then that's all we'll need to show in order to show that the categorical imperative is binding on a person from that point of view. In other words, um, whether or not we demonstrate that a person is free empirically or scientifically or from, theoret from the point of view of theoretical reason, if we can demonstrate that uh, a person in deliberation uh, assumes oneself to be free, then in deliberation, one will be bound by the categorical narrative. Because there's a, a more practical presupposition of freedom from that perspective. Uh, and therefore, from that perspective, the argument will go through. And we will have, as it were, made the assumption that we are free, so that from that point of view, the categorical imperative applies in our deliberation. But that's all we need. That's all we, that's all Kant thinks we need in order to establish the binding nature of the categorical imperative on what? On our deliberation. I mean, that's exactly what we're trying to show, that in our practical deliberation, we ought to take the categorical imperative as binding on us as a requirement of practical reason. So um, it doesn't matter what we decide from a theoretical point of view of things. If from a practical point of view we think of ourselves as free, that's enough to establish what we might call practical freedom. Um, we're bound in our deliberations by the moral law. Um, and Kant thinks that in our practical deliberations, we do assume that we're free. Kant thinks that in, in thinking about, in considering what reasons we have to do this or that, we've already made the assumption that our decision about the greater strength of reasons, our decision about our judgment about what we have most reason to do can be effective. That we can respond to our judgment about reason. But without being determined by anything prior. That it's up to us to affirm one reason or another. It's up to us to decide which reason has the greater weight which side of a dilemma to go for. And in that deliberation, we're assuming that we have the capacity to respond to our reason, respond to our judgment, our own judgment about what to do. Um, yeah, so I, so I want to make sure this point is clear. So this is from a deliberative point of view when we're choosing one thing or another and we're thinking about the reasons to do one, we're thinking about the reasons to do one. Um, so you're deciding, um, I don't know, you're deciding what your major is going to be. You're deliberating about how, which major to declare. And so you think to yourself, well, 
if I do this, the classes will be much more interesting to me. But on the other hand, the prospects of a job are a little bit more dicey. On the other hand, if I declare that major, I'm going to be bored silly, but income will be uh, most likely to be higher. And so I have to decide which of those reasons is weightier. Which of those is more compelling to me? Which of those is something that um, is, is more important? Which of those is better? Okay, when you're deliberating on this, when you're considering the reasons for one or another, there would be no point to doing that if you thought that your decision was already determined. You're assuming that you are able to respond and make a choice based on your assessment of those reasons, based on the strength of those reasons, based on your judgment about the strength of those reasons. And therefore, from a practical point of view, you've already considered yourself to be free, not determined by anything outside of your own judgment, outside of your own assessment of the strength of those reasons. And therefore, you've considered yourself to be autonomous. You've considered yourself to be free to choose one or another. And therefore, for a practical point of view, you've considered yourself to satisfy the antecedent to the requirements, to, to, to the argument that we're free, and therefore, bound by the category. Yes? There's a whole lot of assumptions in that. We're saying that values and judgment are not subject to external influence? Subject to external influence. Um, so in we, we can recognize that we are imperfectly rational. And so we can recognize that I have a temptation to go for the easier way out rather than the long term, what's in my long term self -interest. So certainly we can recognize, we can reflect on our own reasoning and decide that, and recognize that, certainly I can reflect on my own reasoning and recognize that when I'm drunk, I tend to make bad decisions. I tend to make decisions influenced by something outside of my reasoning. And so maybe you want to take steps to ensure that you're not declaring your major when you're drunk. But, but this is still you deciding what reasons there are for or against something. You're not determined by external causes. So like all the reasons are still external. Okay, so reasons are external influences, but this is just like the case of the hypothetical imperative that, we, that I mentioned before. Right? This is this is determined by your judgment about the strength of these various reasons. So, so reasons are not external to your reason. You can fall back on your system of values. And if those aren't subject to external influences. Your system of values. I'm not sure what you mean by that. There. Your judgment is based on your values and what you consider to be good. But aren't your values subject to external influence? Okay, but okay, wait, wait, wait. For Kant, Kant's not a subjectivist. He doesn't think that whatever you happen to value is good. He thinks that, I mean, the whole point here is to establish standards of reason. For example, the idea of the hypothetical merit. For example, the idea of the categorical narrative. So these are objective standards of rationality for assessing your values, for assessing what it is that you take to be good. So if your values satisfy those requirements, then they're fine. Then